Hi everybody, welcome to episode number eight of Patterson in Pursuit. And I'll be honest, I don't think this interview could have gone better. I didn't know what to expect at first, but at the end of it, I was just flabbergasted that it went so well. So as many of you know, I'm kind of a contrarian when it comes to the philosophy of mathematics. I seem to be rejecting the mainstream conclusions in mathematics for the last century, and I'm honestly trying to get to the bottom of why I just can't wrap my head around some of the claims of modern mathematics. So I thought, well, I'm gonna be in Dublin, Ireland, and I need to talk to a mathematician about this. So my intention going into this, in all sincerity, is the expectation that no mathematician is going to agree with me because I disagree with the foundations of mathematics for the last century. So I sent out an email to Professor Gary McGuire, who is a professor at the University College of Dublin. He is the head of the Mathematics and Statistics Department, saying, hey, look, you know, I've, I'm struggling with this concept. Will you be able to help me out? I said, yeah, that'd be great. So I had absolutely no idea that in the very short period of time in our interview, turns out he agrees with me on almost all, on almost all points, which was absolutely flabbergasting. In the world of the philosophy of mathematics, there is a very, very, very small school that's called the finitist school of mathematics, which essentially rejects the idea of any completed infinities. Now, if I had to put myself in a school, that's the school I'd be a part of. And it sounds like that's also the school that Gary would be a part of. This was entirely coincidental. I'm expecting in the future that the vast majority of mathematicians I'm gonna be speaking with won't agree with the ideas that you're about to hear, but it's really awesome that off the get-go, I get to talk to somebody that seems to understand some of the hesitation that I have when it comes to infinity. The stuff that we're talking about in this interview you can find at the show notes page this week is steve-patterson.com slash eight. As I said earlier, Professor Gary McGuire is the head of the Math and Statistics Department at the University College Dublin. And like everybody else that lives on this side of the Atlantic Ocean, he's got a very charming accent. I just love the interview I had with Dr. Westcott. I love the, the English accent. This interview, I love the Irish accent. It just makes these conversations that much more enjoyable when you're talking about heavy material. I really hope you guys enjoy this interview. First of all, Professor Gary McGuire, thank you very much for speaking with me today. Thank you. You're welcome. So I have a lot of questions for you because I have been struggling with one particular concept in mathematics for quite a while, and that's the conception of infinity. And I know that infinities are accepted into modern mathematics, and to a large degree, the, the fiery debates happened uh, a century ago, but I still fully can't wrap my head around some things um, considering infinity in mathematics. So I was thinking to start off with, it would be helpful to lay out exactly what we mean by the term infinite or infinity and kind of just get the basic conceptual definition out there. And I'll give you my understanding of what I think the term means. And if I'm wrong, please correct me. So I always understood infinite or infinity to mean something like never ending or without boundaries or limitless or never completed, something like that. Is that fair? I think, yes, I think that's a very good description of infinity. I think that increasing without bound is probably the way to think about it, rather than the fact that infinity is some kind of a number, or some kind mm -hmm. of an object, a number which is bigger than any other number or something like that. Because that, that implies that infinity is a particular thing. It's an object, if you like, at the top of a ladder or something. Mm -hmm. But we should think of it as a, as a never-ending ladder. So uh, you can always go one rung higher on the ladder. I know that that conception is very um, uh, foundationally linked with modern mathematics in set theory in particular, the idea of an, uh, infinite sets at the, at the very core of the foundations of mathematics. So here's what I'm struggling with in particular. The idea that there can be such a thing as a completed infinity or an actual infinity, that, an infinity that is, that is realized at some point. That, just for me, being outside of mathematics, strikes me as, as contradictory to think that there could be an infinite set. Uh, for example, seems like something that couldn't even be just by laying out the basic concepts. So can you help me... Can you help me explain what I'm missing there? Um, not really, but, uh, <laughs> but in, in some ways, um, 
I think of it as it's an abstract idea. It's a mathematical concept. So does infinity exist in the real world is, is an interesting question. And mm -hmm. I think probably not. Now, you might find people who disagree with me, but I think it probably doesn't. However, we mathematicians have gotten used to thinking about infinity um, as, as the famous mathematician John von Neumann said, when you're understanding mathematics, you, you don't understand mathematics, you just get used to it. <laughs> so, so in some ways, the concept of infinity is, is like that. In, in, to me, you, you kind of, we kind of get used to it and we think of infinity as an object, as we get used to it as a mathematical object. And so we get used to thinking about it and even different kinds of infinity. But, you know, do they really exist? Personally, I think not. Okay, so one question is kind of the relationship between um, mathematics and the real world. To say, I, I think I definitely agree with you that there can't be in the real world some kind of infinite set. But my issue is kind of one step beneath that. It's that the, even the concept itself of an infinite set, whether or not it, it exists in the real world, strikes me as something that's um, contradictory. Because we, we were saying earlier, it never ending. Is, is the the definition or or never completed is the definition of infinity or infinite and yet when we say there is an infinite set doesn't that mean that it's like a strict contradiction in terms so a, a set being understood as a collection of elements in a set a definite collection but how could you have a definite collection that is actually never ending it seems like you would never actually get any kind of infinite set Yes. Yeah. I mean, yes, you're right. And that's why, as, as, you, as you mentioned earlier, it's one of the axioms of mathematics that such an object exists. So we, uh, the classic example of an infinite set is the, the, the positive whole numbers, the positive integers, one, two, three, four, and so on and so on. And we think of that set just goes on forever. And that's, if you like, Everybody, I think, is, is somehow used to thinking of, of that set. However, you know, you can never write them all down. Right. That's what they, that's, it's never ending. So does the set of natural numbers, as we call them, does the set of natural numbers exist? Well, that's, that's the mathematical axiom. That's an assumption we make. We, all, we, we have to make that assumption in order to go on. So for somebody that is not a mathematician and would look at would look at it and say, well, that's, that seems like a very dicey way of reasoning to think that let's just take this as an axiom and go from there when this doesn't seem like it's a clearly analyzed possibility. Like so, so if we were to go outside of mathematics, if we were to say something mm -hmm. like, you know, I believe in X and somebody mm -hmm. says, oh, well, why do you believe in X? He says, well, I take, it as a, I take it as assumption so that I can work from there. I mean, we wouldn't accept that as being you know, a satisfactory reason. So is there, surely there's more than, there's more um, justification than just taking it as an assumption. Do you think that's fair? Um, well, for, to do completely rigorous mathematics and set theory, it, it, I think it has been shown, as, as you said, there's an axiom of infinity. So has been shown to be, to be necessary, mm -hmm. but so that's not a good answer as far as you're concerned. <laughs> Well, as somebody outside of well, <laughs> as yeah. somebody outside of mathematics, my, my interest is in you know discovering truth. As a philosopher, that's really what I'm interested in, and mm -hmm. um, I'm very interested in methods of reasoning for you know why people end up at certain conclusions they do, and it seems like for something so uh, foundational, a lot of conclusions are derived from set theory and from incorporating infinities into uh, modern mathematics. It seems like every axiom would need to be scrutinized to make sure that it's a true axiom and not just a you know a convenient one so we can do calculations from it. Every, every axiom is in mathematics is carefully analyzed, very carefully analyzed and scrutinized to see if it's necessary. Mm. So we would certainly not have any axiom that wasn't absolutely necessary for the development of the in entire theory of mathematics. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, I mean, if, if any axiom can be derived, another famous example would be in geometry. You have Euclid's, uh, the fifth postulate, 
Mm -hmm. And um, for a long time, it was assumed and uh, people tried to derive the fifth postulate from the other four. And people thought that it wasn't necessary, that it could be derived from the other four, but it turned out it was necessary because you, these non-Euclidean geometries were discovered, which satisfied the first four, but not the fifth. Mm -hmm. So that fifth one was absolutely necessary in Euclidean geometry. It could not be derived from the other four. And the same thing happens in set theory. We, set theory has been reduced, if you like, to these axioms, and each one is absolutely necessary. That's what that's what you know. Mathematicians, the foundational mathematicians, have done. Okay, that's something I would love to. Um, maybe we can get into Euclid a little bit later because I think that's actually a really important thing that you bring up. Um, so, can we revisit this idea of the let's say the the set of the positive integers? I think is what you brought up. This. Um, mm -hmm. We assume that this is an infinite set. There's different ways that you can conceptualize numbers. So uh, for, for me, for example, this is how I think this is the most accurate way of conceiving of what numbers are. And then thinking of numbers this way completely resolves any questions of infinity. So I would say something like numbers aren't abstract objects that are separate of our conception of them. Numbers are concepts. They're, they're created by human minds. And their, their existence is entirely dependent on our conception of them. And if that's true, then it would, then it would mean that there's no such thing as any infinite sets um, because you can't conceptualize all of an infinity. And the question of, you know, what are all of the, the, the positive integers is kind of a mistaken question. It's not what they are. It's whatever ones you've specified. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. As far as you go, that's as big as the set is going to be, but it's not going to be beyond what you haven't conceptualized. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think you're right. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think that, you know, we can, we can conceptualize up to a million or up to a billion, or we can conceptualize any particular number. Something I like to do with my students is I, I go to the board and I write down some random string of numbers, one, three, five, zero, eight, seven, so on, so on, all the way across the board. And I end up with 50 digits on the board and I say, here's a number. Um, before today, none of you have ever thought about this number. <laughs> but it's a natural number. And um, this is, a, this is we can go this far, we can conceptualize this number, but there's always going to be a bigger number. Mm -hmm. And no matter what number we think of, there's always a bigger one. So that's the concept of, of infinity. That's an excellent example. And what I would say is, even the way we phrase it, though, I think is important. So it's one thing to say there's always a bigger number versus there's always a number we can think of that's bigger than this. So it's, it's one is like your, um, kind of the platonic way of thinking of mathematics where out there in the world, there are this. There's this infinite amount of numbers that we're drawing from, that we're referencing, and there's always bigger ones out there. Versus, you know, mm -hmm. you can always your mind can always add a zero to whatever number you conceive of, and that strikes me as a as a clearer, more accurate way of thinking of infinity. But the trouble is, in and I'm I'm very persuaded. I'm very persuaded by my own ideas. Well, <laughs> uh, yeah. in in thinking of things this way, uh, it it rejects the axiom of infinity. It says, oh, well, if that's the case, then there are no infinite sets, and therefore everything that follows from that axiom is there's a flaw in the whole thing, which strikes me as kind of a, a radical position to take. Yeah, I would, I don't know, we're, we're kind of thinking, we're talking about, in a way, mental constructions here, aren't we? We're not, we're not talking about things that exist in the real life. These, these are all things that exist in our mind. Mm -hmm. So when you take, if you think of this set of all positive integers, one, two, three, four, and so on forever, you, you, that's a concept. It's a concept in our mind. We think of, you can think of it as being each number and then throw all the numbers together. But I don't think you can have all the numbers if it's, an in, if it's a non-finite amount. So let me give you an example that I think illustrates what I'm getting at, that it's not even that it's a mental construction, it's that the concept itself is something that is 
logically contradictory, and so we can't it can't even be a mental construction. So, do you think this is a fair analogy? And I've seen this lots of places um, in mathematics where they talk about a circle whose radius is infinite. Is that something that is a fair analogy to think that, oh, we can conceptualize a circle whose radius is infinite? No, I would say you need to go back a step. If you're going to conceptualize that, you you have to be able to conceptualize infinity in the first place. Yeah, and what, what I'm saying is I think it can be demonstrated that the idea of a of a circle with an infinite radius is something that we can't conceptualize. That, that, so, so, for example, mm -hmm. I was just talking to somebody about this. Um, and they were saying, "Yeah, well, the, you can you can think of a circle, you know, with an infinitely sized radius." And the the question would be this: What would the curvature be of a circle with a radius of an infinite size? So. If it's the case that the there is actually a curvature, some curvature, then it, it necessarily means the circle is finite because you just follow the curvature around and you have a finite circle, whatever mm -hmm. it is. But if there's no curvature, which is the only other option, then it's a straight line. And if it's and straight lines certainly aren't circles. And so I would say, well, therefore, it can't be that you could even have you can't even conceptualize a, a, an infinitely sized circle. Yeah, I, I, I see the, this is sort of common in mathematics, yes, to think of a straight line as an infinite circle. If you, um, <clears throat> it's a way some people conceptualize the, the, real, the, the real line, the number line with infinity is you imagine the, taking it at either end and bringing the two ends, uh, wrapping them around and joining them up together and you get a circle. Um, one point on the circle is infinity. Personally, I don't I think I agree with you. I think I, I can't conceptualize that because I can't conceptualize infinity. So it's the same thing as, as thinking about infinity is thinking about this circle. It doesn't really help me. Um, but to go back to your earlier point of a logical contradiction, I don't see a logical contradiction here between them. Um, could, could you elaborate on, on the logical contradiction? I don't see it. Logical contradiction in the short. Sure. Yeah. So that that was I was trying to give an example of of the logical contradiction that I think I think we might actually be on the same page with the infinite circle thing. My I gave that example to say um, it is certainly not the case that circles are straight lines or that parts of circles are straight lines. Those concepts are mutually exclusive, and therefore it can't be the case. I, I would say the concept of an infinite circle is a logical contradiction. Because what we mean by circle and what we mean by straight line are mutually exclusive. And I would say that the reason that's a, that's a logical contradiction is the same reason that an infinite set is a contradiction, where we're saying it is a, def a well-defined set or well-defined thing, but it actually isn't a well-defined thing because the boundaries are never ending. So you, have, you, ever you never actually get the boundaries because they can't ever be anywhere. Yeah, yes. I, I think we are on the same page. I think um so I think I do I agree with you. Yeah. It's but I don't think I still don't think there's a logical contradiction here. I think we as we were saying earlier, you postulate the existence of the infinite set. We 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 assume the existence of the, the positive integers. We just kind of assume they exist and we assume that we can put them into a, a set. That's what ma mathematics does. But uh, that doesn't imply that it's not logically contradictory, right? So, so we could say the same thing about square circles. We say, well, we just assume the existence of square circles. And what I would say is, well, if you unpack the concept of a square circle, it's a logical contradiction. And wouldn't you say that's the same thing with the, the infinite circle and a straight line, that when you unpack, when you unpack the concepts, it is, it is something that's impossible and therefore, it shouldn't be an axiom. And that, wouldn't that also then apply to infinite sets? That it's that it's it's like saying we're, we have a square circle at the bottom of our as, as we just take it as an axiom. Mm, well, I'm not sure. I'd have to go in to ask you what you mean by a square circle. But you you can in th yes you can take anything you want as an axiom. Yes, um, <clears throat> but it can't contradict the previous axioms. Or each axiom should be, if you like, independent of all the previous axioms. So you can't, 
they should be necessary. This is what I was saying earlier when mathematicians study the axioms a lot and they make sure that each axiom is really necessary. It's independent of the others. Um, but it, and yet it's necessary for us to develop a theory. If we have too few axioms, we can't develop a mathematical theory. So we need somewhere to start. And the axioms are where we start. And we can't, if we throw in stupid axioms, we're going to get contradictions. So we're, we're also not going to get a good theory out of it. So let's, let's explore, if we can, a little bit more about this idea of the um, logical contradiction, because it sounds like we're in agreements a lot of the way, but not quite completely. And so maybe this is the piece of the puzzle that I'm missing mm -hmm. here. Um, you, we agree that in actuality, there's no infinite set. Is that right? Yes, I think so. <laughs> that if that's the case, um, is, so that's, what is the reason that you would say there is no infinite set? What I would say is it's because the concept is logically contradictory. The concept of a set and the concept of infinity are mutually exclusive. And I would say that's a logical thing. What would you, why do you think there's no infinite set? Well, I, I can't, because I think, I mean, in the, in the world we live in, is that what you mean? Um, well, it depends. It, it, that's what I mean. If that's what you mean, <laughs> so so what is your yeah. what is your objection? I mean, in, in the world I live in, of the things that I can really conceive of, um, I I think everything I can conceive of is finite. Is my my personal yeah. belief, but I'm happy to accept for the purposes of developing a mathematical theory, I can accept the existence of an infinite set because I can I can think of you know, the numbers one, two, three, four, five, and so on forever. And I can, I can think of putting all of them into a bag, some kind of a bag, which I call a set. Uh, but not all of them, right? And not if there's an infinite amount, you can't put all of them in. Well, exactly. I, I can't. In, in the real world, I can't. But in my head, I can, I have to, I, I have to accept that as a, as an axiom. If I'm going to develop uh, a ma mathematics, couldn't there be an alternative? I mean, wouldn't it be so? F so if I were to try to construct a theory based on axioms, I would say one of the it should be a principle, or maybe an axiom that um, the concepts that we're using shouldn't be so impossible in in reality. I mean, it seems yeah. like by saying yeah. there's an infinite set, we're saying we are condemning this to never be applicable to the real world. Or even, even, e e not g even just to be applicable to the real world, but never actually be conceptualized. That there's an axiom here, which when we really break it down, doesn't even work in the mental world because we can't fully conceive of the infinite set and putting all the numbers in a bag because by definition, if it's infinite, you can't fit them all in. Y yes, I, I agree. I mean, there actually, I don't, I don't want to talk too much maybe about foundational mathematics, but there is... A school of thought in mathematics where everything is finite mm -hmm. so you don't use any infinite sets and and you try and develop mathematics simply using only finite sets and finite objects and and that's quite interesting to do and it's perfectly valid and it just it, i don't know it just turns out that especially for applications of mathematics in the real world it's more useful to us to allow infinite sets. We're coming to the um, sort of applicability of mathematics in the real world, which is somewhat surprising, but it, it turns out that mathematics is useful. We can, mm -hmm. we can go to the moon and so on using mathematics, but that mathematics uses these infinite sets. That is very uh, counterintuitive for sure. Can we, I do want to talk about that a little bit because that's something I don't know that much about. Where so um, can you give some examples of where the use of infinite sets is something that's necessary to be applicable to the real world? Because I because in my mind, being ignorant on this topic, I would say, well, if there's two competing um, schools of mathematics, mm -hmm. you have the finitist school mm -hmm. and you have the standard school that accepts infinities. Um, it seems like they that you whatever you can do in the the standard world accepting infinities you can probably do without infinities so where where is the where's the benefit what that you get when you accept the infinities well actually that's that's a really good point 
Um, you're you're absolutely right in that you everything that you can do, everything that we've done could be done with with let's call it the finite mathematics, mm -hmm. because when you actually go to implement things, you write computer programs and you build machines and everything. Everything is actually finite. Mm -hmm. Everything has to be approximated. But the theories that we use in order to design those machines are somehow easier if we use allow the infinite mathematics. Mm -hmm. We use the infinite mathematics, we come up with these theories, and then we build things. Yes, those things could have been built only using finite mathematics. It just, I don't know why we don't do it that way, but we don't. It's the way the world has evolved. <laughs> we don't. Wow, that's that's fascinating. So would you say, so are you saying um, that conceptually speaking, there's nothing that infinity adds to the equation that you just can't get from finite mathematics, but it just, the let's say the calculations and the, the formulations are a lot easier when you allow infinities. That's exactly right, yeah. In my opinion, that's, that's, that's a perfect way of putting it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that is, um, this is, uh, this is fantastic. If, if, um, I do want to talk just a little bit, you mentioned, um, Euclid, I was just reading a book, um, actually, I'm, this is now one of my favorite books, is called The End of Certainty by Morris Klein, and, uh, it talks uh, specifically about the history of mathematics moving from, uh, like certain, uh, supposedly certain foundations to less certain foundations, and now modern mathematics, there's the certainty is lost, and uh, it comes back a lot to the conceptualizations of infinity and uh, Euclid. So we don't have to go in any great detail, but can you uh, give a little bit more um, explanation? Maybe I, I don't know if you know this off the top of your head, so if not, that's totally fine. For the you said there was five postulates in uh, Euclid when we're talking about geometry, and I. I don't know them off the top of my head. And the fifth postulate is one that everybody's been taking for granted, apparently, for a few thousand years. And in the, I believe it was the late 18th century and in the 19th century, people started challenging um, that this fifth postulate was something that was, uh, that you could derive from the other four. And they took kind of as an axiom that let's, let's say this isn't true. Um, and let's see what we get from there. And there's the development of non-Euclidean geometry. So can maybe we talk a little bit about that? Like what, what was the denial um, of the fifth postulate? And then what was the result with the non-Euclidean geometries? Well, well sure. I'm, um, I don't know if I can recall all the details off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. But the, the fifth postulate, roughly speaking, it's if you have two straight lines, we're talking about in the plane now, in a, in a plane. So if you've got two straight lines drawn on a piece of paper and they're not parallel, then they will meet at some point. Mm -hmm. I think, roughly speaking, I, I've got it right. Yes. But it's something, like, it's something like that. That's the fifth postulate, which it sounds, when I say it like that, it sounds completely, I think you'd accept it. Uh-huh. Um, you'd probably accept that it's true. So it makes a lot of sense. And everybody thought, yeah, the, the controversy was that it maybe was this postulate necessary or could it be derived? There were four preceding postulates or axioms and people were wondering, could it be derived from the other four? Mm -hmm. And I think over centuries, many people tried to prove that it could be derived. Um, but the advent of non-Euclidean geometries meant that this was a geometry which satisfies the first four, but not the fifth. Mm -hmm. So that means that implies it cannot be derived. So you can have things which satisfy the first four and not the fifth. But if it could be derived, then anything which satisfied the first four would also satisfy the fifth. Mm -hmm. So is the claim that... It is at least logically possible that you could have non-Euclidean geometry be existent. So there's nothing internally inconsistent about um, non-Euclidean geometry, even if that's not the world we live in right now. Yes, it's entirely possible that there is a, a world or a universe that could have non-Euclidean geometries. In fact, people have tried to measure our universe 
to see if if our universe could be non-Euclidean in, in, in some very tiny way. But all the indications are that it, our universe is, is Euclidean. Um, but when I say an example of a non-Euclidean might would be the idea would be that you live on some kind of a curved surface. So um, if I think of like, for example, living on a sphere, if you think of two two lines on a sphere, they could be um, not they would if they're not parallel, they would intersect in two points. So there might be one point on one side of the sphere and another point on the other side of the sphere where they would both intersect. So in the plane, that doesn't happen. If they're not parallel, they're only going to meet in one point. Mm -hmm. um, so that kind of thing, that's the kind of thing that could happen in a non-Euclidean uh, universe. But all, I think all the indications are that our, at least spatially, I'm not going into space, time or relativity, mm -hmm. now, but spatially, our universe is Euclidean. So for an example like that, it seems like intuitively the idea of a sphere, like we're saying, well, imagine you're living on a sphere, that to me presupposes Euclidean geometry. So the only, our conception of what sphere is, is only in the, in the conception of Euclidean space. So it doesn't even seem like you could, when we say something is curved, mm -hmm. that implies that, you know, it's not straight. And I, so it seems like there, it, it's kind of like the, um, the axiom of infinity in the set, in the sense that it was like, well, let's just assume, let's just take that as an axiom and see what follows versus whether or not that concept is even possible. I, I would so tentatively say something like the e Euclidean space is something which is like conceptually inescapable, that even when we talk about any other, n try to talk about non-Euclidean spaces, it still is within the framework of like a meta-Euclidean space. Yeah, I see. I think I, I think I know what you're getting at. And I remember struggling with this for a long time as a student. But the, the point to think, think about it as if, if, if you lived on a sphere, but you didn't know that you lived on a sphere mm -hmm. and you couldn't leave the sphere, how would you know that you live on a sphere? It's, in a way, it's what happened many centuries ago and people used to think the earth was flat because if, you look, if we look around us, the, the earth seems to be flat. Mm -hmm. And if you can't leave the earth, and um, how do you know that our Earth is not flat? Yes, even in that circumstance, though, we're saying in reality, the the thing that you live on is curved. But even saying that would mean it's still in the context. What we mean by curved is still in the context of Euclidean geometry. So the, the only, in fact, I, I vaguely remember this, but I'm not confident mm -hmm. enough to say this conclusively. I vaguely remember one of the um, postulates um, of non-Euclidean geometry is something along the lines of like um, ultimately lines would have to be understood as circles, as 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 uh, small sections of really really big circles in order to make it work. And that seems like that seems unsatisfactory. <laughs> Like uh, it, it seems like a logical contradiction. Take the, you know, let's assume that this is the case. Let's assume that lines are just small sections of really big circles, meaning that ultimately the space we're dealing with is curved, and so therefore lines are circles. But it would seem like, well, that's then it's not a line. If it's curved, it's certainly not a line. Even if it's very close to it, it's not. It's not actually that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I understand what you mean. Still, I mean, I have two, two points I could make. One of, one of the classic theorems of Euclidean geometry is that if you add up the three, take a triangle, and you add up the three angles in a triangle, the sum of the angles is 180 degrees. Mm -hmm. um, and that can be derived from the axioms. And in a non-Euclidean geometry, that's not true. But if you think of a... I think this is the same point you're making. Think of a triangle drawn on a sphere, mm -hmm. and the, the lines will be curved, and the angles will therefore be different, and the three angles won't add up to 180 degrees. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's a way of, in principle, you could tell if the earth, that the Earth was uh, curved, 
and not flat. If you drew a big triangle, <laughs> and measured the three angles <laughs> and added them up. So there are ways of, this is my second point is, I think there are, there are intrinsic ways of telling whether the surface you live on is curved or not curved. Mm -hmm. And I know what you mean by, you know, curved is a Euclidean concept, curved and not curved, this is a Euclidean concept, but mm -hmm. it actually isn't. There actually are ways of doing it intrinsically Oh, see, that's interesting that you say that, because I, I would intuitively think the opposite, that when we say, oh, we're drawing a triangle on a curved surface, what I would say is, well, if it turns out that the lines are actually curved, then it's not a triangle, and you're not dealing with a triangle, you're dealing with something, you know, something else. Yeah, no, I, 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 I see what you mean, I see what you mean, and, and maybe you're right, but I, I still, I stick to my point that there are ways like that. Mm -hmm. of of telling intrinsically determining whether you live on a euclidean or in a euclidean world or in a non-euclidean world okay and um so the last concept that i want to talk to you about is very closely related to these two and it's about the application of infinities in calculus it's specifically the concept of convergence which um i think is immensely practical and i think uh, i think we can we can accept convergence in like a finitist mathematics at least how i'm con how i'm conceiving of it but i have uh, coming from a, uh, my interest in philosophy um there's these very famous paradoxes i'm sure you're aware of zeno's paradoxes uh, paradoxes mm -hmm. of motion where you know in order to get from point a to point b you have to go through uh, the, the middle point, and then to get to that middle point, you have to go through another middle point and another middle, middle point ad infinitum. And his argument was, that, well, therefore, it's impossible because you can't move over an infinite amount of points. And the standard um, resolution to Zeno's paradoxes is, oh, well, calculus solves that. And that's the argument that we give that calculus solves that. And I have a resolution for how calculus does solve that, but it's not including infinities. But most people say, oh, well, there's this concept of convergence. So if we can, let's just take not maybe not the standard Zeno example. I just want to take another example, and then you can help me m maybe solve the, the problem here. Let's say that we're trying to construct a pie. And the way we do that is by taking um, halves of pie in succession. So we start with half a pie, and then we add a quarter of a pie, and then we add an eighth of a pie, and then a sixteenth. The, the standard idea would be, uh, would be at some point you actually complete the pie by adding successive halves together. Eventually, yes, these things converge and you get a whole pie. Is that a fair, would you say that that is the standard resolution to something like that, that eventually it converges into a whole pie? Yes, I think that's a very good way of thinking about it. I think that, but when you say eventually, you mm -hmm. mean um, you, in some sense, this is again infinity. So. When you say eventually, you mean after an infinite amount of time has elapsed, you you will have a complete pie. But at any particular finite time, you won't have a complete pie. You might be very, very, very close, as close as you like to a complete pie. But after any finite time, you won't have a complete pie. But couldn't we say then after, if, if it's the case that after, so we maybe we could phrase, rephrase it this way. <clears throat> At no point in time would you ever have a complete pie. Is that true? Yes. That's true. So but doesn't isn't that mutually exclusive with the idea that at some point you do get a complete pie? If it's at no point you ever get a complete pie? It depend what do you mean by at some point you get a complete pie? Or eventually you get a complete pie. Eventually means or at some point, that means in the limit. There's this mathematical idea of a limit. So in the limit, mm -hmm. as as time approaches infinity, or as the number of slices you add approaches infinity, that's when you get a complete pie. But it's not, it's not something you can approach. I mean, it seems like by definition, we're saying, I, I, it, 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 we're saying that the pie at no point in time ever, would you ever get a completed pie, right? Because yes. that's, yes would mean that it would be a finite, that, that, that the, you know, the calculations of the divisions would stop. And if that means at no point you would ever get a completed pie, doesn't that mean 
that you never get a completed pie? Yes, <laughs> I, I agree. Yep, you'll never get well, a if that's completed true, pie. It's, it's, and I, it's, in, it's an infinite process. I mean, it's, it wouldn't be an actually infinite process, right? I mean, it's because what we're saying, what what it seems like, and this I totally agree with. What it seems like we're saying is, if the if what you're doing, if you have a process of actually putting the, uh, together a pie this way, then you're never actually going to get a whole pie. You're always going to have a little bit left over. Yes, exactly. Now, if that's true, then does that not mean that uh, Zeno's paradoxes are not solved by calculus? Because the claim is not that the runner will get ever so close to the final point, but that the runner will actually complete the race. Um, that the that ultimately you know the, or, the, or the pie will ultimately be completed. Doesn't that mean that Zeno Zeno had a was making a good, a good point there? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, a really good point. I mean, I, I'm agreeing with you, I'm not disagreeing with you. So, <laughs> so what do you think of this this uh, this potential resolution that the reason um, calculus does work in the real world is because reality is finite. It's not infinitely divisible, and therefore at some point the calculations terminate, and then, you know, you can complete the whole pie, and you can you would complete the race. Well, in the real world, as we were saying earlier, we don't get into the infinite, so we have to approximate everything by a finite number. And so, in the real world, mm -hmm. we would get, we, we wouldn't be able to I don't know. If we were adding smaller and smaller and smaller pieces of pie, we'd eventually have to stop somewhere. We can't, we can't get ever smaller and smaller and smaller pieces. We just can't do that. So we have to stop at some smallest possible piece, and then we add that in, and we finish the pie. And what about with something like distance? So could we say the same thing that ultimately, that this is what I think the resolution is to Zeno's paradoxes, is that there is like a base a base distance unit in the universe that you can't actually divide in half because otherwise it seems like motion would be impossible but if there's a if there's like a base unit of distance then everything seems to resolve itself just like a base unit of pi i i kind of yeah i kind of agree i agree with you um i think in in the real world in practice there is a base unit of distance mm -hmm. yeah and what we get into you almost get into theoretical physics i mean you get down to nanometers and you get down to Planck's constant and quantum mechanics and all that sort of mm -hmm. stuff if you want to start mm -hmm. the uncertainty principle you'll get down to if you want to get ever smaller and smaller and smaller um, you're going to get down to distances where the laws of physics are different but you know we, we don't do that in everyday life we certainly don't do that right well um, on that note uh, I won't take any more of your time, but I really, really appreciate this conversation. I think uh, I really think this has been great. I know I've learned a lot. Well, thank you very much. I really enjoyed it, too. So that was my interview with Professor Gary McGuire. I don't know what else to say. I mean, really, after that interview, I was just uh, flabbergasted that, that the, the one in a million happened where I found somebody that seems to agree uh, with my own personal perspective on this. I'd recommend, if this sounds interesting to you, check out the show notes page, steve-patterson.com slash eight, and I'll have a link there where you can get the book that I was talking about, The End of Certainty by Morris Klein. Absolutely essential book to read if you're interested in these ideas. Make sure to tune in next week as well, because just like I was assuming to disagree with Professor Gary McGuire, and we turned out agreeing, I had an interview at Columbia University when I was in New York City with a professor that I thought I would agree with and I ended up disagreeing with in the most radical way possible. My raison d'etre is logic. That's what my upcoming book, Square One, is about, is about logic and the necessity of logic. And my interview at Columbia was with a gentleman who is a logical pluralist which means that he believes there's competing logics out there, that logic, there is ultimately no bedrock for epistemology, <laughs> which I went into the interview thinking the opposite was going to be the case, and uh, it just turned into a absolutely magnificent interview. So make sure to tune in next week to hear my interview with somebody that I disagree with 110% on, but we remain cordial throughout, and at the end, I feel like uh, I feel like I made a friend. So that's the show. Thanks, everybody, for listening, and I hope you have a great day.